Good morning all. Our reading this morning is coming from a number of passages in the book of Revelation. Um, it's entitled The Seven Beatitudes of the Revelation of Jesus Christ to His Seven John. So I'll just be reading them in order. Um, and they're coming from different chapters and different verses. So the first one is from Revelation 1 and verse 3. Blessed is anyone who reads the words of his prophecy, and bless, bless are those who hear him, if they treasure the content, because the time is near. Number two is Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, blessed indeed, the Spirit says. Now they can rest forever after their work, since their good deeds go with them. Number three, Revelation 16, 15. Blessed is anyone who kept watch, has kept watch, and has kept his clothes on, so that he does not go out naked and expose his shame. Number four, Revelation 19 and 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Number five, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. Number 6, Revelation 22, 7. I am coming soon. Blessed are those who keep the prophetic message of this book. And number 7, Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who will have washed their robes clean, so that they will have the right to feed on the tree of life and can come through the gates into the city. We are incredibly thankful to God for His Word. His Word stands as the only book um, in humanity that tells us not only about our condition, but also about how we can go about to remedy that condition. That there is a Saviour that has died for us, that loves us, that, that cherishes us and longs for us to be close to Him so that we can be as He is. Going through the book of Revelation, there's many parts of Revelation that, that, that has really inspired me to, to, to want to be a believer that wants to be closer to Christ. As we look at the book of Revelation, obviously right in the beginning, it talks about, um, Jesus says to John, here are the things that have been, here are the things that are, and here are the things to come. And we are kind of in that place where the things are yet to come. But in all of that, God gives us promises all the way through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is there for believers to understand our final state. Our final state of being with Christ, of being with Him in His kingdom, of understanding His love and, His, and, 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 and the joy that it's going to be for us to be face to face with Him. There's nothing like being face to face with family. We, um, in December, we're going back to South Africa for uh, most of our family, well, Sharon and the kids. It, it, it's been 11 years since they last were there. So for me, it's been five. But to be face to face with family, we um, have got a, two chalets that we are going to be renting right on, 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 on the sea. Um, my sister has organized that for us. And it's going to be so wonderful to be there, to spend time with people. But can you imagine, as believers, not only those that we know now, but those that have gone before and those that are yet to come, we are going to be together. Each one of us, family, blood relatives, not our blood, but the blood of the Lamb. That's going to be wonderful. So today I want to, I want to have a look at the... Um, the Beatitudes in the book of Revelation, as, as Kerry read to us, say they're wonderful. If, 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 if I can make the suggestion that you, as we go through them, take a pen and underline it, or if you've got some like crayon or something like that, just put a big asterisk next to it or NB, it's, it's incredibly important. These are important for us as believers to realize the call of God on our lives as we face the future that is quite uncertain. We think about the war that's happening in Europe. We think about the riots in, um, uh, across France. There's over 500 public buildings that have been burnt to bits in France. We look at Greece, um, we look at Portugal, we look at Spain, we look at Europe and we see that they're on the precipice of a financial collapse. 
most, a lot of the, the countries in the world are, are, are at that place, but, but even with the circumstances that unfold before us, Christ does not change. He will never change. His purposes are set, and if we are His people, if we can call according to His purposes, and we are obedient according to His purposes, then you know what? All of that is just circumstance. It's all by the way. He is eternal and we are going to live with Him. You can't as a believer in Christ for, uh, 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 for long um, to uh, be a believer for long to know certain iconic Bible verses and truths. They, they, they are there and you've heard them from when you were in Sunday school or if you've been in church at any time. You've heard these truths and they've been, they've been spoken to you, they've been uh, read about, they've been sung about. And we recognize them, and, and there's so many of them, uh, not only in the church, but in society as well. If I had to start quoting Bible verses, I'm sure that you'll be able to complete them. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only beloved Son. You, you know that. People out there know that. If I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yeah, people know these, these things. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. There's so many of these that just roll off of our tongue and we know them really well. You get the picture. A number of these we know well. In our passage today, or the passages that uh, Kerry read, we are going to be looking at the Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. So that brings to mind the question, well, what is a Beatitude? You, we, we say Beatitude, but do we know what that word really means? Well, if you go into Matthew chapter 5, you marvel at the simplicity of the Beatitudes, but you also marvel at the complexity of these sayings of Jesus. Jesus seems to be elevating the responsibility of the believer to a whole new level. He, he puts it right up there that we almost can't, can't reach. So what is the definition of a Beatitude? It's named from the initial words Beati Sunt or Beatus, Blessed One. That's from the Latin Vulgate Bible. The Beatitudes describe the blessedness of those who have certain qualities or experiences peculiar to those belonging to the Kingdom of Heaven. So notice, this is about the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, Christ is talking about this incredible Kingdom, this Kingdom of Heaven, and these sayings go in hand in hand with the kingdom of heaven. The word beatitude comes from the Latin uh, beatitudo, meaning blessedness. The phrase blessed are in each beatitude implies a current state of happiness or well-being. The expression held a powerful meaning of divine joy and perfect happiness to the people of Christ's day. To those days, imagine Jesus sitting on, 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 on the side of the, the mountain as he, he gives the Sermon on the Mount, as he, he, he speaks to the people, and his people are before him, and his voice runs down the side of the, of, of the valley, and, and they hear it, it's in their, their ears, and, and, and this is right at the beginning of his teaching. Not much has happened up until this point, when he gathers these people, and these people are following him all over the place, and he says these sayings, these beatitudes, and they hear it, and, and I'm sure some people would have said, wow. What is this teaching? Is it even possible to follow this teaching? But you see, Christ is commending the people for the state of their being compared to the kingdom of God. To bring this home to us today, I would like to take a brief look at those Beatitudes in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. So if you want to turn there, you're more than welcome. And comment on them, just a brief comment, so that it gives us a foundation so that we can launch into the book of Revelation and those uh, Beatitudes. First one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we realize that we are so bereft of, of anything that could vaguely cause us to be saved, and that we need a Savior, we realize that our spiritual state is not that of God's Spirit. We see just how poor and wretched we are. We, 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 we sing songs like um, uh, Amazing Grace, that talks about God's grace and, and, and say the rich like me. I'm a wretched person and I need saving. 
But you see, yeah, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of God. If you realize that you're poor in spirit and you need God's spirit, praise God for that. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. The next one, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we realize that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, and that nothing we can do can change that. Understand that, please know today, there's nothing that you can do to your spiritual state. God has to do it all. You have got no say of your original birth, when your mother gave birth to you, and you've got no say of your spiritual birth. God draws you, and then He makes you realize that you need salvation. But you see, it's only the divine working of Christ through that that we can be saved. We see the futility of striving to work our way to heaven. We mourn over our state of being. God will comfort you and bless you with His comfort. Not the comfort of the world. Not this, this, this comfort that we see now because this comfort is temporal. We look for an eternal comfort. The comfort of Christ. The next one, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What is the definition of meekness? Meekness isn't weakness. Some people will see people being meek and they think, man, that's, that's, that's just a weak, soppy Christian. That's like, you know when you take toilet paper and you wet it? It's of no use to anybody. It's not that. You see, the definition of, of, of meekness is power Unto, uh, under control. The enormous power that, that God has, but under control. As Jesus lived his life on earth, we, we didn't see him do anything that was outside of God's calling on his life. He had all the power, but it was under control. The Father controlled that power. He always had the, capa uh, the, the capacity to destroy people with one action, with one thought. But he never used his power for personal use or gain. His power was always under control. Be humble with the gifts that God has given you. Know your limitations. Know what God has given you so that you can use it to his glory. The next one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Today our pleasures seem to take control of our lives. We hunger and thirst for the wrong things. We so want the things of the world, these temporary things. We gather stuff, we hoard stuff, we bring stuff to ourselves. We chase after money. Jesus is saying to those he spoke to, when you desire the right things, you will be satisfied. Righteousness is to be sought after as if you were starving for food. Righteousness needs to be sought after, desired more than the desire for water. The next one, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We have received mercy from God Himself in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we are so privileged, we must extend that same forgiveness and mercy to others. God so longs for us to do that. It's so easy for us to receive forgiveness. But do we give it? Are we merciful in our hearts to forgive people? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. One of God's attributes is holiness. Total purity. No defilement, defilement whatsoever. We are unable to comprehend what a pure heart is, let alone have one. Yet, our example of Jesus in the scripture is exact representation of the Father. Perfect in every way. Pure of heart. Totally holy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Making peace is not the same as keeping peace. Peacemakers are people who are willing to confront sin. They're willing to go to a brother, a sister, and say, that was not right. Can we make this right? Please, please, please. God's character comes into question if we don't do the right thing. We should not sweep things under the rug. We should not just dismiss things. We need to uh, come to people instead of placating people, but uh, confront.
confront them and say it lovingly, in a way, and say, let's, let's, let's come together. Let's seek peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Also the next one. Blessed are, uh, are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. When we give Christ our sin, He gives us His righteousness. That righteousness is alien to this world. That is unrighteous. This world loves to hate. It revels in injustice. It's just phenomenal how much injustice is out there. But not only out there, but also here in our hearts. How much injustice do we have in our own hearts? If you are persecuted for Christ's righteousness, you will be hated by the world and the satanic system. Christ promises you His kingdom for standing on the bedrock of the gospel. For standing on the gospel itself. The life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. That wonderful news that is the gospel, the good news. Can you see the high standard that Christ set while He was walking on this earth? And no one, none of us has the strength to do that. All of this is about the strength that the Spirit gives us. Only by relying on the Spirit of God can we do these things. There's no way that you and I can do this in our own strength. Remember these Beatitudes. Remember where they take place. Right at the beginning of the book of Matthew. Jesus speaks to the crowd. Assembled there on the mountainside. He moves them deeper in teaching them. And then we come to the cross. And we see him die. And we see him uh, be put in the grave and then resurrected. Then after his resurrection, he gives the disciples the great commission. And then ascends into heaven. And he's, he's, he's taken that, that, that great commission and he's given it to them. And says, go, make disciples. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded below. I'm with you, even to the end of the age. I will be with you. Fear not. The apostles carry on the work of Christ until there is possibly one last apostle remaining in that John, who gets exiled to the island of Patmos. John is in his 90s, receives a vision of Christ himself and an unfolding of the future and what it would look like. We've just spent about 23 weeks going through the book of Revelation and, and it's been a wonderful time. But we, we still can't capture everything that, that John spoke about. But in between all of this, there's been the sayings of Christ. And his final blessing he gives to believers from uh, John's day on, on Patmos, but also to us today. As we read these, they, they are so relevant to our lives here, right now. And I want us to have a look at those seven. So please turn in the book of Revelation um, and, and, and highlight them and put them in italic or, 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 or do something so that they stand out to you when you read the book of Revelation. So the first one is Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Right at the beginning of the book of Revelation, Jesus said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. There are three things that need to take place here in this verse for the blessing to take hold. Number one, the person needs to read the word aloud. The person needs to hear and the person needs to keep. Those three things are incredibly important. For us to learn, we need to read, we need to hear, and we need to do. It is so important for us to understand that God's word read aloud has a profound effect on our hearts and our minds. I know when, when I was growing up and we had to study and I was the worst, worst student. I was horrendous. My two favorite subjects was first and second grade. I loved those. Um, nothing else happened there. I, I loved to go play soccer and, 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 and so I was a terrible student. But you know what? The two things that helped me was hearing the teacher speak and writing things down. 
I wasn't very good at doing the things that it said I should be doing. But those two really impacted me. So I'm a very, very visual person and I love to hear. But now, since I've been preaching for the last 16 years, I've been writing a lot. And through that, it has really soaked into me. So God wants us to read His Word aloud. He wants us to hear the words of the prophecy. He wants us to write these things down, but He wants us to live it. He really wants us to live His Word. But you see, we are able to read without hearing. Sometimes we'll hear something and it will scope the top of us or it will just go from one ear and out the other. We're also able to hear without keeping. You just have to come to the school to see that. I spent time in, in one of the classrooms the other boys, oh wow, they, 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 they're quite something else. These kids, they don't hear instructions. <laughs> Especially the boys, not at all. So we can hear and we don't do. But you see, when we combine those three, God in His faithfulness cements His divine prophecy in our hearts, in our minds. He reminds us why we do it. For the time is near. A time is coming when Christ is going to appear. Christ can come in at any time. Today is the day of redemption, of salvation. Christ has done it all for us. All we need to do is realize that we are sinners in the hands of a holy God and our sins have been forgiven. We are a temple. He's eternal. He will return to take his bride back with him, back home. Are you ready? Are you reading his word? Are you listening to his word? Are you being obedient to his word? So those are three things we need to do. Read, listen, obey. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. We are all going to expire one day. I hope you know that. I hope that's not news to anybody. <laughs> We've all got an expiring date. When we take our first breath, it is inevitable that one day we'll take our last. Hebrews 9.27 says, For it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. All of us will die. But you see, that's the physical death. That's a certainty. But there is a second death. And that's far worse than dying in this world. It is dying spiritually, the second death. If we are not in Christ, we will die in our sin and we will face the consequences of what we've done on this earth. Of all our sin, all our sin will be gathered onto our own shoulders and we will bear the burden of our own sin. But you see, for us, those who believe in Jesus for salvation from our sin, we die in Christ. We are in Him. We're not in this world. We are able to rest in Him. He's our eternal, eternal rest from everything we have experienced as believers on earth. All our labors that God gave us to do is complete. Once we pass away, we go to be with Him. All the works that Christ gave us to do is finished and we rest in Christ. It's in Him that we rest. In the Old Testament, they had the Sabbath, the Sabbath day of rest where you, you toiled for six days and on the seventh day you had the Sabbath and no work was to be done. You weren't even allowed to walk a certain distance. But you see, Christ is our rest. We are in Him, so we rest in Him. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is our Sabbath. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. We are to be ever watchful over our lives, keeping ourselves from sin. Temptation is not far off. We know ourselves. You know the, 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 the place your heart and mind, your life can go to. When temptation hits, be vigilant. Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a, 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 a hungry lion, seeking whom he should devour. 
See sin as a self-destructive wild animal that can't be tamed. Can't be tamed. Think of it as a ferocious cat, a big tiger that's going to devour you within an instant. Stay away to your own shortcomings. Be aware of your blind spots. We all have them. There's not one person in this world right now that doesn't have a blind spot. Keep your garments on. We wear Christ's righteousness as clothes that we must wear every single day. Put on your armor, the full armor of God. Be clothed and ready for action. Remember that we are in a war. We are in a war. Might not be physical, but it is spiritual. Which is a far greater war. Be prepared. Don't be those who will be clothed in nakedness. Of your own deeds. Shame will follow you to the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll be eternally lost. Christ will come as a thief in the night. It doesn't mean that he's a thief. He says, just, just as a thief will come when you don't know. That's when Christ will come. And when he comes, will you be faithful? Will you be there? Be ready to face Christ. Don't be caught out by not being prepared. Revelation 19, 9. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Years ago, I um, had a young man, and um, he, he really, really liked this girl. And they were both very young, and he was very serious about this girl. And... Um, and this guy's boss actually threatened him and said, look, if you carry on with this relationship, I don't think you've got a future at this company. And he told me about this and he was destroyed. His heart was broken because he really loved this girl. And so I went to his back I went to his boss and I just absolutely got stuck into this guy. I said, his intentions are incredibly honorable. About a year after that, he was to be married, but I wasn't invited to the wedding. And I felt, I felt terrible. Because I'm just thinking, man, I would love to see this young man and this young lady get married, but there was a lot of circumstances around there, and I was excluded from that wedding. This is nothing compared to being excluded from the Lamb's wedding, the Lamb's supper. If you're excluded from that, you're excluded from the very presence of God. You are pushed away to the very edges of humanity. You see, Christ has paid for His bride with His life. He sends the invitation to you to be part of this greatest banquet that can ever be held. You are invited by the King of Kings and Lord of all. Tell me, what would you do if you received an invitation from a royal somewhere? I don't know, you could pick the royal. And their, their children, one of their children are getting married, and they send you a personal invitation. What will you do? Would you say, ah, uh, nah, nah. You will go and buy the finest clothes. You will, it doesn't matter how you get there, but you will get there to be part of that ceremony. To stand there and watch what's happening. See, Christ invites you to be a special guest. A special guest. At the greatest banquet that would ever be. Don't say no. Accept his invitation. Do whatever it takes to be at that reception. Give up that simple practice. Stop gossiping. Stop being involved in immorality. Obey the words of truth as per the Spirit of God. God's Spirit is inside you. Listen to his Spirit. These words of Christ are true and can be, can be trusted. Second last one. Oh, third last one. Blessed, is, uh, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. For such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. Who shares in the first resurrection? Well, we do. As believers, if we die in Christ, he will raise us up again. The dead in Christ will rise to eternal life in the presence of Jesus. Those who are holy 
set apart for the purposes of Christ. What does it mean to be holy? Well, holiness is an attribute of God, according to 1 Peter. We are to be holy as God is holy. God is not the, uh, of this world. So sin is not part of Him. He's outside of time, outside of matter, outside of space. He always existed. His very nature is purity. A tame example is, you know when a child is born, and you all have seen these beautiful little kids, when they come out, you know, they clean them up, and when they clean them up, they put them in that beautiful little blanket, and you look at this child, and you see the child for the first time, don't they look perfect? Don't they look wonderful? You kind of wish, can't they stay like that? <laughs> be wonderful, be perfect? Nothing ever changes. He can't change. We are called to purity, wholeness, to be without sin. But you see, only when we are in Christ, with His righteousness, in, 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 in like, uh, totally taking over our lives, can we be considered holy. Because of Christ and His work on the cross, because of His saving us from our sin, do we have a part in the first resurrection. The second resurrection is a judgment that will send people to an eternal damnation. We will have no part of that. Those who are raised first will be priests of God in the coming millennium. A thousand years of reigning with Christ, worshipping Him in His presence, being face to face. Revelation 22, 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. We have an event that is going to be happening at any time from this moment on. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? As you look at yourself and you weigh yourself on the scales of Christ, are you ready? Do you keep the words of this prophecy? You see, it's not a work we do, but a responsibility we have to Christ. Obedience is required. Are we obedient? What does it mean to be obedient to the Word of God? Well, we see it as being the only truth that eternally exists. It is never going to pass away. We must regard it as a treasure, an incredible treasure that is dear to our hearts, more costly than gold, eternally relevant to our lives. No matter how humanity changes, God's Word is eternal. It will never change. Neither does God. And then lastly, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. There's three things there. Are you washed in the blood of Jesus? Do you have the right to the tree of life? Will you enter the city by the gates? Brothers and sisters, that's what we've got before us. God's call, God's invitation to the best place we could ever imagine. Please go home, read these seven, know them, be convicted by, by, by the Holy Spirit because of these seven and understand who Christ is. Spirit's work in each one of our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that we can come to you, knowing that you give us everything, and all we bring is our sin. Would you clothe us in your righteousness today? For Jesus' sake. Amen.